Welcome to all of it. We got all of it. All of it. All <laughs> of it. <laughs> Our guest is Secretary Madeline Albright, Brian Cranston, Tank and the Bangas, Barry Jenkins, Celia Keenan Bolger, Aaron Lee Carr, S. Bronza Spalding, Gideon Glick, Helen Yoyemi, Fab Five Fred, Benga Akanabi, Brene Brown, Tony Goldwyn, Tandy Newton, Jake Gyllenhaal. <laughs> Welcome to all of it. Thank you so much for joining us. Hello. What a pleasure. Hi. Hi. This is so fun. I'll see you tomorrow. We're here every day, 12 to 2. The impromptu concert. I love it. I love it. I love it. I was there for the love of it. You must tell the truth. I'm sure everyone's perspective is unique. There's a lot of truth about the pain of being an immigrant, mm. but they're jokes. We find the funny. It's our strength. At what point do you think women's health care will stop being a political issue? When half of Congress can get pregnant. Ran out of words, but we do what we do. We mm. don't have no words, so we got to trade twos. So we trade twos. I was just really dope groove. And Allison was so nice to meet you. <laughs>Hi, everybody. Welcome to our January Get Lit with All of It book club event. I'm Allison Stewart, host of the book club Get Lit and the radio show All of It, hence this contraption over here, this magic microphone. Um, For those of you who don't know about our show, we're on 12 to 2 on WNYC. It's an arts and culture show, but we truly love books on this show, which is why we're so excited to have this book club. And I always say our book clubs are a little bit more like book parties with special guests of honor. First of all, parties need music, and we have music at every book club. Today, we have the amazing guitar duo of Rodrigo and Gabriela, and of course, we have our special guest of honor, the author of this book that we have been reading, Mexican Gothic. We also want to let you know that at the end of this hour, we will tell you about our next book, which is underneath my chair, but we're going to hold it off to be a surprise. So let's get to the event of the evening. Our January selection was named a best book of 2020 by the Washington Post, NPR, The New Yorker, Vox, and so many more. Mexican Gothic has already been optioned for a limited series on Hulu by Kelly Ripa and Mark Consuelos. Now we have wonderful partners for this book club at the New York Public Library, and they make e-copies available to you. And 6,519 of you borrowed an e-copy of the book from our partners at the New York Public Library. And you have you have written to us, we host our book club events on our Instagram at all of it, WNYC. And people have been writing in all month about this book. Jessica wrote to us, I was reacting out loud during those last 60 pages. Maria wrote, it was such a fun read, and Catherine wrote simply, it got cray. So without further ado, let's bring in Sylvia Moreno-Garcia. Sylvia, thank you for being with us. Oh, hi. Thank you for having me. I hope I don't cut off, but we'll see how lucky we are today. I have fingers crossed. Uh, Mexican Gothic, the title, of course, referring to a genre... There are references in the book, allusions, I should say, to Weathering Heights and Jane Eyre. What did you want, what did you think as a writer, what opportunities were there to upend some of the conventions of a Gothic novel by having this protagonist who is a woman of color, a Mexican woman at the center of your story? Gothic fiction is a very malleable genre by its nature. It is the intersection of several things into one. And it is a proto-genre, so it is kind of the mother of different currents, including what we might consider the modern romance novel, but also the modern horror novel, depending on whether you're talking about Gothic horror, which is more your Dracula's, um, uh, the monk, that sort of story, or whether you're go- talking about Gothic romance, which is a different strain, and there you're talking about your Jane Eyre, your Wuthering Heights, your Rebecca, uh, what I call Scooby-Doo stories, where in the end, the supernatural element turns out to have a natural cause. It's not a ghost. It's a mad wife in the attic. And in the end, the thing that the heroine is going through is solving a mystery, but also finding romantic fulfillment by the last page. So you have these um, kind of two different flavors of Gothic and And because it has a long history, there's a lot of tropes that we recognize. It's like pornography. I know it when I see it in a way for many of us because it has this long legacy, unlike uh, some newer kinds of genres. So because of that, you can play with it very easily because it's like a Lego kit. In my case, one of the things that I wanted to play with uh, was 
putting a protagonist of color within a traditional Gothic story, because in Gothics of the of the 18th century and the 19th century, the element of horror comes from the foreigner. They are kind of this scary thing. And you see that, for example, in Dracula, Dracula is a foreign element. He's an Eastern element. He's an invading sort of element that is taking over uh, these elements of whiteness. And this reappears in other forms of Gothic fiction where um, uh, Catholics, for example, in Radcliffe's novels are scary people who have weird customs and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, so you have the person of color acting as a monster and the white person, white society, white Protestant Anglo, you know, men as the pinnacle of society, the good thing, and these other people as the bad thing. And in this case, um, it's, it flips it around. Let's talk about Noemi. So when you were thinking about Noemi as your protagonist, was she always going to be a socialite? Yes. Yes. Why? Uh, it was, well, I was inspired by a photograph of a family member of mine that was at a party and she was looking over her shoulder. So I, so I really like that imagery of a beautiful young woman, but also because often in Gothic romances, the female heroine is in a kind of subservient position. So if you think about Jane Eyre, um, well, she is basically a nanny. I mean, she's there to take care of a child. And, and often all the women are in that kind of position. Uh, if they're married to the husband, the husband is dominant and the wife is dependent on him. So I wanted somebody who, who could come into the situation and not be the maid, you know, mm -hmm. in, in the house, but be somebody who would look at these people as their equal and would be able to call them out on some of their crap. What was your thought behind describing her clothing in such details and to her for her to care so much about her clothing in some circumstances when it would be the last thing on my mind? Yeah, um, I think we have very narrow roles for women. So we believe that women can be one thing and one thing alone. So um, if a woman is attractive or is interested in certain quote unquote feminine pursuits such as fashion or uh, makeup or things like that, then she's a bit of an airhead and she can't um, do anything else. Now, when I was doing my master's degree for fun, I did something that was called a uh, hot scientist, hot Victorian scientist of the week. And when I found a picture of an attractive 19th century man, you know, male scientist, because they were more common than women, I would uh, put his picture up and say, you know, this is, you know, this is Tesla, the hot scientist of the week. And, and there were many, you know, hot scientists of the week. Um, you know, it, it, nobody ever said, um, wow, Tessa looks too cute to have been smart. But if I had put probably a picture of a woman um, who had, you know, seemed attractive, I'm sure that the comments, you know, people might have thought that like, wow, you know, Madame Curie looked good in a nice dress and she also had a brain. So there seems to be, yeah, that idea that, you know, like, like uh, Noemi says at one point, it's like women can't do two things at the same time. And I, I work for the faculty of science of a university and I certainly see a lot of bright young women who are also very interested in, you know, in physics and in wearing nice shoes. And there's nothing really wrong about that. Let's talk about the town where this takes place. As Noemi decides to head off to help her cousin Catalina, she ends up in this town, town El Triunfo. Mm -hmm. close. Um, and it's it's sort of based on a real place. This yes. place that once was called a little slice of Cornwall is how mm -hmm. it was described because of the colonialism there. I believe the name of it was Real del Monte. Mm -hmm. um, it was, uh, first of all, why did you want to put it in this place? And what was important about the history of this place to make sure that wound up in your novel? Well, my family, part of my family is from Hidalgo, so they're from that part of the world. So I know that part. And I visited this specific town when I was a teenager. And when I went, I remember that we went to the English cemetery, which uh, was, you know, and there was a gate and we had to knock on a door until somebody, we found somebody who had a key and they opened the door and we walked in and it was misty. Um, 
and there were all these gravestones and tall trees and it felt like I had walked into uh, a 1950s hammer film you know like Christopher Lee or Peter Cushing would be waiting uh, right beyond uh, one of the gravestones or the mausoleum so it was just this very different image of being it was at this location you I was in Pachuca just you know a you know, a little while before in, in a larger city that looked different and in, 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 in Mexico City before that. And then suddenly I was in the middle of the mountains in this cold, misty place, and it felt like I was in a horror movie. And so I wanted to use that in some way. And it had a very interesting history because I don't think I remember when Mexican Gothic came out, some people told me, oh, I didn't know that there had been English people in Mexico, I thought it was just Spaniards and that they left. And, and that, like, that's not true. There were different uh, waves of groups of foreigners. There were French people because we were invaded several times, um, Americans, Irish, uh, British too, uh, as you can see by the settlement. And, uh, and so it's just, um, it just, I think, exposed an interesting slice of Mexico that most people would not be familiar with. And it just seemed to me physically like the perfect space for something spooky to happen. Let's talk about some of the other characters in Mexican Gothic. I want to talk about Frances, one of the Doyles, this Doyle family that her family has married into this, this British family who think quite highly of themselves. We find out why, obviously. Um, we meet Frances and we asked our listeners about halfway through the book if they trusted Frances. Frances is the only person in the family who speaks Spanish. Francis is the person who seems to want to help Noemi and Catalina. 73% that said they did not trust him <laughs> halfway through the book. Why did you write it in such a way that it took us a long time to trust Francis? Oh, there's, there's a lot of doubt, I think, throughout the book. And I mean, there's a lot of doubt throughout Gothic narratives. You're often wondering, is this a supernatural thing or isn't it? If you're, if you're thinking back about um, things like uh, like Jane Eyre, you know, like the thing is, is there a ghost in the house or not? It, it, it's a recurrent theme. And so there's also a sense of is the woman insane or not? Often women are being gaslighted in these narratives. So you don't know if they're perceiving reality correctly or incorrectly. So I wanted to make things very porous in a way in more than one sense so that you couldn't know what was going on with the house in general you couldn't go know what was going on with her dreams in general you couldn't also understand whether Francis was a friend or a foe and what was up with Virgil and Catalina and everybody else so it's you know it's a lot of it goes back and forth where sometimes you think oh okay is Virgil being reasonable or not um but, you know, but that's like how gaslighting works. That's, you know, it's, it's undermining your sense of reality and of self and making you think, oh, maybe I'm the one who's wrong here. And, you know, he's he's totally right. So Francis is just one element in this kind of web of uncertainty. Let's talk about Catalina's husband, Virgil. We yes. asked our readers if they thought if Catalina had married Virgil willingly, 56% said no, 44% <laughs> said yes. And we don't get to hear much about that backstory. That's all in, in your head. So did Catalina marry for love or did she fall for his charms or was he exerting the Doyle power over her? I think she fell for his charms. But when you think about these kinds of relationships, and again, we if we look back at fiction, for example, at... Um, Wuthering Heights and Heathcliff, and when he marries uh, the woman he marries, who is not Catherine, it's Isabella, I think is her name. Um, there is this scene where he kind of forcefully kisses her. And, uh, and then she's like, oh, she thinks this is romantic, like she really does. And I think it's the same thing for, um, for Catalina. Um, she thinks that this is romantic. This is a guy, this is a Heathcliff, or, you know, or this is the, you know, Mr. De Winter from Rebecca. This is a guy out of a traditional romance novel um, who is sweeping her off her feet. And all those warning signs that a normal person would say, don't go with that guy, to her are a reaffirmation of romantic love and passion. And of course, we've got Noemi as a sort of meta commentary because Noemi doesn't really buy any of that. And she thinks that her cousin probably reads too many, you know, stories <laughs> of that type. But yeah, I, I think Catalina um, fell for it hook 
and sinker because she was primed to look for that. She thought this was a man of her dreams, you know, and this uh, kind of, you know, genteel poverty and this high house in the mist. It all sounds really romantic until you find out that your husband is up to something nefarious and there's not a phone nearby. I'd love to talk about racism and eugenics. You bring it up fairly early in the book, about the first 50 pages or so. Um, and of course, it made me think it made me think of the film Get Out recently <laughs> that we have seen this. Um, what is it about horror that is a good tool to talk about racism? Well, I think any genre is a, is a good tool to talk about racism or, or any other topic that, that you want to. One of the things about horror is that um, for a long time, it offered this other point of view where, like I said, the, you know, the white person, uh, the male person is, is the standard, the status quo. And the intrusive point is um, the person of color. That, that, is, that is the monstrous, that, that is what we consider traditionally. In, in certain narratives, definitely. And I think now what is happening is that when you have writers who are coming or creators who are coming into this, they're looking at it and well, you know, I am the monster, literally, you know, I am the horrible in mouth thing that Lovecraft feared and that eugenicists feared too, you know, the, the mixture of races, the, you know, the, uh, the de-evolution of, of humanity made into a physical shape. So obviously, you know, when people like Lovecraft say something like, and she was black, you know, oh, that's the last line, you know, of a story, the horror. Well, to me, that's not scary because, you know, I know people of color and, you know, I am a yeah, person of color. So obviously that's not, is, is what's going to freak me out. So what I'm going to put that I'm going to find horrific is other things. And those are things like racism, like white supremacy, um, like misogyny, uh, like the oppression of women. It's because, you know, the, the things that would have terrified writers of a different time period are, are not things that are going to, you know, scare me at all. Oh, no, you know, a black woman and a white man married the horror. It's like, well, OK, so what? Right. So we have different fears, different anxieties, and we are using fantastic fiction to express some of them. But it's because, you know, there are more writers now of color that are doing this before. I think we were a smaller pool and now we're kind of expanding. What were the fears and anxieties that you wanted to explore in this book? around racism? One of the main ones was uh, the female body and the body of the woman of color specifically and how it's seen by whiteness as something that can be used and abused. I've been in situations where uh, people have commented on my physical appearance and uh, I remember being in a conversation with some white woman and they were commenting on my breasts, you know, perky brown breasts. That was, you know, very upsetting. Um, you know, people seeing me uh, sometimes, you know, as, as, as something that is easily interchangeable and acquired, you know, like, well, you are obviously a visible minority woman, so you should be happy to get my attention, even though that attention may be bad and uh, really rude, you know, you should be flattered that I'm paying attention to you, uh, that sort of stuff. And it's something that I have heard from other women of color. I do think uh, women of color are often in a very vulnerable position. And it's, it's not only the fact that you are thought to be sexually available, you know, the fiery Latina who's easy, but there's gradients of color. The darker you are, uh, also the more degraded people to uh, tend to think of, think of you that you are. So it's this, this scale, like this Pantone scale of humanity and inhumanity almost that goes on. I want to ask you about pacing in the novel mm -hmm. and about grossing us all out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So the, the beginning of the novel, we're learning about everybody. It has a very steady pace. And then page 204, I have 204 will haunt me. Uh, <laughs> uh, there's this moment where Howard, you write Howard Doyle, this is the, for people who read the book, this is the, the patriarch, smiled at her, showing off his stained teeth, stained with black. And then he pressed his lips against hers. Noemi felt his tongue in her mouth and then saliva burning down her throat. Ugh. We asked readers to tell us which um, parts of the book grossed them out the most. Uh, moving Walls, another wrote The Black Spit, me too. <laughs> another wrote Howard Naked on the Bed Covered in Sores, and another wrote Wall Fungus. <laughs> All right, I have many questions about this. Do you 
enjoy grossing out your readers? Uh, no, I don't. I actually really like <laughs> fungus. I, I am a big fan of, of mushrooms. Um, but you made them so scary. Yeah, but you know, it's like any organism, right? It's a natural organism is not good or bad in a human sense. It's just an organism that is seeking to live. Mm. Uh, even a parasite or a virus is not doesn't necessarily hate you personally. And it's the same with any kind of fungus. The fungus is innocent is what I have said to people who have asked me is the fungus fungus evil. And I have said the fungus is innocent in this tale. Um, <laughs> it's been corrupted. Poor fungus. Uh, but you know, I just, I like, I've always been interested in body horror and I've been afraid of body horror at the same time. I read, it's called The Voice in the Night, I think. And it's a story, it's it's a fungus horror story. So if, if anybody wants to look at a, look for it, it's very old. And the Japanese movie Matango is inspired it. So anyway, that and um, other stories like uh, botanical stories, this is Ebold Roots, Killer Tales of Botanical Horror. So these are stories from the 1800s that have like evil plants and that kind of stuff. So that's been something that I just, uh, the thing that I find most horrifying, I guess, in in life is the loss of autonomy. And, mm -hmm. and, I, and I was trying to do that with this, with, with this kind of fungus. And, and that's what's going on. Uh, going going on there and and the body horror is just you know yes yeah it's things that that creep me out I also grew up in a moldy house you know I would peel the wallpaper and there was mold behind it oh, no. so that was just the way I grew up yeah no but I turned out fine I think <laughs> <laughs> might explain some of the things you wrote so, yeah <laughs> um do you want to I would love to pose some reader questions to you are you out for sure. that yeah okay great uh Lily asks what was the point of making Francis unattractive? Unattractive. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I don't think he's like the ugliest man that I ever lived, but I think that Noemi is just used to a different kind of guy. She looks at, um, you know, she, she thinks about Pedro Infante. I mean, often what happens is that we tend to think that white people are naturally attractive. And, you know, like I said, there's a gradient. So she comes in and she's looking at him and she's saying, well, you're not the prime specimen in in the whole universe first of all like you know whiteness does not assure um you know attractiveness by itself even though in our society it often is that case it's it's something that you can exchange for higher points but anyway uh, but the other thing is that she's had really kind of shallow relationships with men and part of this is because she doesn't want to get too attached to somebody so she's always kind of looking for people who are pretty but maybe not so compatible and he is not like that she actually likes him for who he is and um and that happens with people. Sometimes you meet somebody and they get more attractive when you meet, when you actually get to know them. This is from Kathy. Why was Howard Doyle so physically fascinated and attracted to Noemi? Oh, yeah. Um, well, it's again, it's this thing where I think there's this exotic sort of sense sometimes with 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 men when they I often found it in Mexico when sometimes when I met people who were visiting the country, they would think that it was a buffet of women, you know, like the women were there to be consumed like that. And they thought that just because they were white and they had money, women would immediately um, kind of flock, flock to them. And I, I think that is his sense. His sense is, is one that he's a white man, so he can have anything he wants. And so he can definitely have her. And why would he even bother asking? This is from Camille. Did you know when writing Francis in the early stages of putting the character together that he was going to be bilingual? Yes, that, that was one of the things because I, I had to figure out for, for a way for them to communicate. So, and I actually know his last name. It's not Doyle because his father was not a Doyle. So, but we didn't put it in the book. Ashton. <laughs> oh, we haven't lost. Oh, connection is looking like it's frozen. Hopefully we'll get Sylvia back in a moment. Yep. Really good questions coming up. Ayaka's question, how is it Francis was so different from his cousin, mother, the house, even the house doctor and the servants were completely brainwashed. <laughs> it, it's like a cult, right? And um, and I, I, I like to read about real crime stories. And one of the things that I'm fascinated with are cults 
actually, and different types of cults. How do you get involved in a cult? How do you volunteer to be branded with a hot iron and think that's a good idea? But it happens. People do do this and, and, and they end up in these situations. But also people leave cults, you know? And, mm-hmm. and I know some people who have been part of cults, they were raised in a cult and then they actually left it. And that's been a very interesting experience because it takes a specific kind of personality to kind of say, I don't really think this is right and I'm going to get out of here. But it's very hard. This is from Ali. Why did you decide to have Noemi and Francis get together in the end? The book clips many of the gothic tropes, but not this. Why was this important to you as opposed to the women ending up alone? Uh, well, there's this romantic element in, in gothic um, novels, but I also, you know, I think it's an element of hope that things need not be you need not be evil simply because of the family where you came from or the circumstances that you came from and you can find happiness and trauma is something that doesn't doom you to solitude forever i I have heard sometimes people say uh well if you have been through trauma then you shouldn't get together in a relationship with somebody until you solve that trauma well some of us have trauma for our entire lives does that mean that we have to be alone for our entire lives and so i thought you know it's okay that this happened but you can still find you know joy and fulfillment and happiness and meet somebody that you like and that you you might have a romantic relationship with them. I don't know if it's going to last for a very long time because life is weird and strange, but I do think, you know, they end up together, at least for a while. <laughs> Let's see. We have several questions about the TV adaptation coming together. Would you play a direct role in molding the narrative in the show so it stays true to your book? Honestly, the TV adaptation is in such early stati- stages that I can't say anything about it. All I've basically done is just sign paperwork at this point. <laughs> well, let me ask you this. Um, in the in the book, uh, you make a reference that Noemi looks like Katie Gerardo, mm-hmm. which of course sent me down a rabbit hole to find a picture of her so I could share that on Instagram. Uh, if you were playing the casting game, is there an actor or an actress that you think about for Noemi or Catalina or for any of the other parts? I think for the the Caucasian parts, it's very easy. Uh, for the for Noemi's part, I think it would have to be somebody who's unknown or less mm. has done less roles. To be frank with you, there's not often not that many good meaty roles for Latinas and there's less Latinas who have a big profile in the market. So while it's, it would be easy for me to blurt like 10 names for Virgil or Francis, it becomes a lot more difficult when you're talking about a Latina. Oh, what a wonderful opportunity this yes. is going to be, especially for some young actress. Uh, and I think you write about an unknown. There's a certain sort of, you don't want to, to recognize the person and bring everything about that person to it. It would be really lovely to have somebody fresh and new, I think. Let's go to Annie. Annie said, why did you use gold as almost a key color from the spores to the manifestation of Agnes in Noemi's dreams? I've used the yellow, the color yellow as a running thing in several short stories. And probably people who haven't read my short stories haven't noticed that thing, but uh, I, it started with a short story that I called Flash Frame, which was partially kind of inspired by uh, a book that, that has a lot of yellow, The King in Yellow. Well, a short, a, yeah, a, a series of stories interpreting The King in Yellow. And in the 1800s, yellow was kind of the color of decadence because there was a journal that was a yellow journal. So it has to do with decadent poetry and art mm. and that kind of stuff. In the end, the women, the women triumph in the end, and they triumph with the help of a medicine woman with the tincture. It's such an important part of the story that she provides them with sort of their superpower to ward off the gloom. What were you thinking about when you were thinking about that character? I found her, even though she's not in the book alive, she's so important. I didn't want to just have kind of the traditional medical doctor. I also wanted to have a medicine woman because it's something that we had in my culture and that I remember 
you know, my grandmother tell me about going to visit La Huesera or La Curandera, that sort of stuff. So it's just a different type of medical knowledge rather than not, not everything medical need occur in kind of a hospital setting, basically, let's put it that way. We had a question and I don't know if it was sparked by you holding up that book, mm -hmm. but people would, a couple of people would like to know other things that they could read that you use possibly as research, whether it's about the, the gross, the mushrooms, about the history of the time. Is there anything, any books you could suggest for people to check out? Yes, there's a book called A Silent Fury by Yuri Herrera. And it came out at the same time as my book by coincidence. It tells the real life story of the mining region that I'm talking about and a tragedy that occurred there where miners were killed. So that's A Silent Fury. I think, uh, well, there's there's many number of Gothic fiction things. Uh, the Yellow Wallpaper, of course, is one of them and all, you know, lots of different mm -hmm. kind of stuff. My heroine is named Ab after Carlos Enrique Tabuada, who was a Mexican film director who made four Gothic films. I don't know how easy they are to see for people nowadays, but I was also kind of trying to ape him in, in some of the work that I did. I think some people thought I was inspired by Guillermo del Toro, but no, it was Carlos Enrique Tabuada and probably Guillermo del Toro was inspired by him. He did these series of Gothic films all set in Mexico. And I liked it because it gives you a different vision of Mexico. We kind of have a stereotypical vision of what it is mm -hmm. and it totally blows it out of, you know, what is normally the expectation. I love that you just gave us a great syllabus. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, before that you go, you're, are you working on a new novel now? That's what the internet says. Yes, uh, my next novel is called Velvet Was the Night. It will be out in August. It is a noir set in 1971 against the political unrest that was happening in Mexico that summer when the Mexican government murdered a group of students. And it has a secretary and a thug both searching for a missing woman, a missing student. So that will be out in August and it's Velvet Was the Night. Sylvia Moreno Garcia, thank you so much for spending time with us. And thank you for this book, even though you did gross us out a little bit. Thank you for having me. At the end of our book, our heroine returns to her beloved Mexico City, which is the hometown of our musical guests tonight, Rodrigo y Gabriela. They first met and started playing together in Mexico City, but it wasn't until moving to Dublin, Ireland, that they really hit big with their just one of a kind, exceptional guitar playing. The music fuses jazz and rock and flamenco and some metal and just something that is uniquely theirs. Rolling Stone has called them guitar virtuosos. We are so grateful to have them with us tonight. Here performing 1111 from their 2009 album of the same name, Grammy Award winners, Rodrigo y Gabriela. <laughs>
And we are back with Rodrigo y Gabriela. Rodrigo, just at the moment, where was that film? That crazy, awesome looking space? Well, in our studio. I mean, we kind of had to become very creative, um, as all uh, know now. And um, we kind of decided to do, uh, you know, like a capsule where we could actually just do uh different sets you know like a white capsule which is pretty much here's got here okay. hello <laughs> yeah hello i was uh so we were just hearing about your space where you sh where you film that video yeah. oh yes so cool so um yeah the, the capsule is kind of related to kind of the the the, the idea uh, behind it is that we could be actually in different worlds that we can you know in uh come up with here um thanks to you know technology and all the things that images and visuals that we can share with people uh from friends from different artists that work together so that's the kind of idea yeah, behind it the song we just heard 11 11 is from an mm -hmm. album where some of the tracks or not all the tracks are you said are influenced by or, or call out to people who have influenced you musicians who have influenced you whose influence do we hear in that song? Oh. Uh, David Gilmore from Pink Floyd. And so well, we are guitarists, so we, we always have um, and our guitar heroes, and one of them is David Gilmore. And all that album is, uh, there's a lot of our guitar heroes. Uh, we pay tribute to them, but that especially 1111 is for David Gilmore, Pink Floyd. <laughs> In the early, when you guys broke out, I read somewhere that you had been in a metal band before. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. so what was the metal scene like in Mexico City at that time? Well, it was actually, uh, it's huge, you know, Mexico, uh, South America, uh, Central America, South America. It's uh, been very good for metal um, bands um, from the early, late 80s, early 90s, when, um, you know, Metallica, became like a, like a, almost like a metal pop band <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, with a with a black album and then um, they just started to 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 come uh, and play like massive stadiums you know not only metallica like all the bands and uh and it just suddenly all the metal scene which was a very underground scene in the mid 80s in mexico just became like super huge and very kind of uh, popular, you know. Lars is somewhere saying, who are you calling pop? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we know them, so. <laughs> Gabriela, how did that time influence the sound that you have now? Because everybody likes to put a list of things of, of your sound, what it sounds like. But I think you guys just sound like you. Yes, um, well, I, I originally, I think um, before I discovered metal music, which was uh, particularly thrash metal, before that, uh, way before that, I, ex I was exposed to great music at home because of my mom and my family, the music lovers. None of the musicians, except my granddad, who played, I think when he was young, he played the trumpet. But um, I was exposed to a lot of great jazz music, you know, the, the, the classic uh, John Coltrane and Louis Armstrong, Ella Fisher, all of that. And then also Beatles, Rolling Stones, and also classical music, but also all the, all the artists from Mexico and from Hispanic America, and like, which is all the tango, which is what is traditional. Uh, tango, boleros, and all of that, and salsa, and all of that. And so I loved music, and always for me, it was just like something that really attracted me. And then I discovered metal, and then I uh, sort of like included in my box of all the music that I loved, and I, I included it there. So when we started playing, we cut the we have the band and all of that, and 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 we, what we, I guess, what me and Rod were so attracted to met, to trash metal music was all the rhythmic parts, all the riffs mm -hmm. and the drumming, and it was just almost tribal. And at that time, in the 
uh, I don't know, late, what was like early yeah, 90s, late 80s, it yeah. went like uh, Sepultura got, got this album uh, Roots, which is so this uh, sort of uh, Amazonian per tribal percussion mixed with the metal and that blew our minds, you know, so <laughs> for me it was just like oh, the perfect combination. And I guess all of that played a role with my hands because when we start playing as a duet, the two of us only, the two of us, I knew a little rhythms, but I knew that you can do a lot of things with with a rhythm. And I'm not the only person who does these things, like a lot of uh, different players, they can do a lot of percussion with the guitars or with other instruments, like the string instruments. And then, and that's where the idea sort of start to blend in in my hand. And when we start playing as a duo, um, I cut the bands in my head, you know, we never thought as duo, we always thought as a full band. And I guess that's where all these uh, technique and rhythms start to kind of happen and all the precaution bits also. Rodrigo, when you write, do you write on an acoustic guitar? Or do you write on an electric guitar? Nowadays uh, in both, uh, because uh, from uh, the Metabolution album, it was the first album that we included electric guitars after three albums. And uh, mm -hmm. so I kind of got comfortable again after many years of not playing and not even owning. And then suddenly I have many again, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I, I, I love it. And now I, I like to play both and I feel very comfortable in both. So yeah, I whatever, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's the same for me now. Gabriela, during this time when we've all had to alter everything, what has that done to your creativity? Oh, like you mean like in the alter, like influence, influence by other things and other art? Or... No, I, I meant by just oh. having to be home, not being able to travel, <laughs> not being able to tour. Yeah, it's just been in this, uh, well, I think to me it's been at least I guess for Rodrigo too, good in the good way of not to be traveling so much. It just gave us the space and the, the sort of like the the time for us to be in touch with the music, with the, with the guitar. And at home, I have a little guitar that I, I love as a practice guitar. So it's very easy to uh, write stuff and play around and record it in the iPhone and all of that. And and that's really incredible, you know, because when we were on the road, there's little time for those things. And now when we have a lot of uh, ideas and also new compositions and new arrangements and all of these things. So it's, it's really good. Also, I guess when we're facing difficult times, it is the best moment for, for artists to create things and to put them out into the world because art can be a healing tool for people and so we since since the the this, this situation started a year ago i think me and rod we kind of felt on a mission to to post things and to record things and bring things and and to our fans which was very important we miss them and we wanted to just put a lot of music and, and performance out there. And Rod, we're going to go out on a song from Metavolution. Meta, meta I can't say it. Say it for me. Meta, Metavolution. It's like Meta from uh, like the, the... Meta. Yeah. The Meta. Evolution from Revolution. So Evolution. Meta. Not from Revolution. From Evolution. Evolution. Yeah. Metavolution. All right. <laughs> we're going to go out on Electric Soul. Tell yes. us about this song. Electric Soul, well, the whole album is like very conceptual in a way. We kind of created this world based on the name of the album, which is Metavolution. As, uh, and as I mentioned, Meta is uh, it, with, with two T's, you know, double T, is the name of a meditation, a, a Buddhist meditation, which is pretty much, you can translate it in um, love and compassion. So uh, evolution is obviously coming from evolution. So it's like uh, for us, this kind of world we created in this album, which is very conceptual, is really a new understanding of the reality, uh, trying to really become that space that holds, um, that awareness that holds every experience outside us and 
just to, to, to go back to who we truly are and not to believe so much in, in the play, in the role we live here as musicians, you know, whatever you do. And just to remember that everything is being held in this space that is endless, timeless. Yeah. Rodrigo y Gabriela, I am a huge fan. Thank you so much for being with us. I have been for a really long time. I was so happy you were able to be on the show with us today. Thank you so much. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Happy, happy days. <laughs> this is Electric Soul. Thank you. Thank you.
Thanks to Rodrigo y Gabriela for those amazing performances. And of course, to Silvia Moreno-Garcia for being with us to discuss Mexican Gothic. Okay, are you ready for our February book? Good. Hold on. We have to do a couple of thank yous because we're polite around here. I want to thank our partners at the New York Public Library. That's Tony Marks, Andrew Medlar, and Brian Bannon. Those are the folks who get these e-copies into the hands of New Yorkers every month. We also want to thank the Green Space team who are on the Zoom world over there. You can't see them. They're all over back there. That is Jennifer, Sachi, Cam, Ricardo, and David. And then all of its producers who work on Get Lit, who get it done every month. That is Megan Ryan. Jordan Loft, and Simon Close. Okay, on to our February Get Lit with All of It book club pick. In honor of Black History Month, we've selected a book with a Black protagonist. Darren is a 22-year-old from Bed-Stuy who graduated as the valedictorian of Bronx Science, but did not go to college. One day while he's working at a Starbucks, his life changes. He lands this big job, and becomes the first black employee at New York's hottest tech startup. Darren reimagines himself as Buck, a ruthless salesman willing to do anything to close a deal. But when tragedy strikes, Darren switches tracks completely. The book is an exciting debut that's being described as a cross between Sorry to Bother You and The Wolf of Wall Street. We are going to be reading Black Buck by Matteo Escaripor. The LA Times said of the book, is Black Buck the first racial satire that's also self-help? Kirkus calls Mateo's writing witty, jazzily discursive, and rhythmically propulsive. Okay, to find out how to borrow your free e-copy from the New York Public Library, head to wnyc.org slash get lit. Go follow us on Instagram at all of it WNYC for our book club updates and participate in these discussions. They're really fun. Okay, and then mark your calendars for Thursday, February 25th at 7 p.m. That's when we are hosting our Get Lit event with Mateo and a musical guest to be announced. I'm Allison Stewart. Thank you so much for joining us for Get Lit, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>